We're going to start this Sunday and work our way through the New Testament letter of Paul in Ephesians. Part of our winter Bible study uh, in our Southern Baptist churches is a study of this book, and it's just such a great book. Uh, we're going to be covering this on Sunday morning and Sunday nights, but the Sunday night will take a topic from the Sunday morning and kind of expand a little bit. But, uh, but I want to encourage you to be a part of that. In the bulletin, there's an outline uh, of everything we're going to be covering, and I uh, encourage you just read the book of Ephesians. We're going to start this morning. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a lengthy text. I really want to kind of move through this uh, in about eight messages, and really, honestly, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a year's worth of preaching. So uh, we're just going to have to kind of move quickly, but I encourage you to read. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of God, of, of, as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. If we have redemption in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. This short little section of scripture, maybe more than I normally would read, in it we find the powerhouse doctrines of the blessedness that is ours in Christ, the doctrine that we are chosen by God, the doctrine of predestination, the doctrinal teaching of the adoption uh, of, uh, of us in Christ unto the Lord. We see the doctrine of redemption. We see the doctrine of forgiveness. I mean, in just these short verses, we're reminded and reminded and reminded who we are in Christ Jesus. Folks, I want to tell you something. When we live life and we go through life, there's times that we need to be reminded there's times that we get a little lost in our thinking and maybe through circumstances or maybe through choices, but we can get tripped up and we can find ourselves struggling. Last week I preached to you about why halt you between two opinions. Why do we stumble uh, like we do in our Christian walk? Well, this morning I want to call to your attention that we need to be reminded who we are in Christ Jesus. And when we get a firm grip of this, it will make a profound difference in how we live every single day ahead of us. So I want to encourage you that. Now, let me give you just a little bit of introduction to the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters, there's six in the book, but the first three are very doctrinal and theological. Uh, uh, they're, they're the powerhouse truths that I've already mentioned uh, when we read through it. Uh, the last three also uh, are doctrinal, and certainly it's the Word of God but they become very practical. So the first three, we kind of learn about who we are, where we are, what God has done, the mystery of the church, these great themes of, of the book of Ephesians. The last three are how to take these themes and apply them uh, into our daily life. It is a letter of encouragement. It is written to encourage believers. This morning's message is a message to encourage you to remember who you are in Christ and the tremendous price that was paid for us to be saved. But also, with any scripture, it's written to edify, to build, but it's also there to rebuke, to encourage, uh, to, to make us mature. 
And so we need to come to the Word of God always with that mindset. Uh, it was written from prison. Paul is imprisoned uh, in Rome when he writes this letter. And so I, if we'll kind of remember that as we go through, I think it will help us appreciate the words that he is writing. He's, he's imprisoned because of the gospel ministry. He's imprisoned because of his identity with Christ. And we know from the, the big story is eventually uh, he will have his life taken. Ephesians is considered a prison letter of Paul. Philippians uh, is considered a prison letter, Colossians and Philemon. And so these are the letters that Paul wrote while he was imprisoned. The church at Ephesus, how did it get there? How did it get started? Well, we uh, believe that Priscilla and Aquila uh, uh, started the church, or as, at least as maybe a home church, a group. Later, Paul is going to come in uh, during uh, his third missionary journey, and he is going to establish a very important city. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in another introduction. But, but he established a church, and he led the church for about three years. Uh, Paul spent three years of his life pouring his heart and life and soul into that group of believers. Now, after he left, young Timothy uh, eventually uh, pastored, we know at least for a year, maybe even a little longer. And during his ministry at the church of Ephesus, uh, Paul charged him uh, to preach doctrine. Uh, within the group, there were some false doctrines that were emerging, probably from some of the elders within the church. And so that gives you a little idea of, of kind of how it got there and, uh, and what they were doing. Now, let's go in directly and let's just start with what Paul introduced. We have the introduction. I'm not going to preach on that. I want to start about the first thing. Matter of fact, the topics that I want to cover this morning is that God has blessed us in Christ. God has chosen us in Christ, okay? I want to see that. God predestined us, and, and of course, uh, uh, eventually, that we'll see what this in Christ is all about. Now, I don't know if there's any way that I can preach all of this. I, I started with just a wonderful uh, vision of, of wiping this out, but I'll tell you, it's just so much. It's just so much. So let's start with the first idea that God has blessed us in Christ. And Paul said he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, if you're here today and you know Christ, and you know that you're saved, and you know that heaven is your home, you know that, would you say amen? Amen. Okay. And sometimes we, we, have, we hesitate. I understand that. But if we know we're saved, I want, you to I want you to remember something. God has blessed you. If I said, are you blessed? We should be able to say amen. But we think, we think, well, the blessing is this. I'm healthy. I got food on the table. I got a roof over my head. I got clothes on my back. I got a pillow and a bed to sleep on at night. Hey, those are all wonderful things, but that's not what this is talking about. And I want us to look beyond. Sometimes we look at the material things of our lives and we look at what I consider superficial. And the reason I say that is, and I, I mentioned this before uh, Christmas, if you look around in here, and I'm, look, I'm excited that, that we've paid this building. I just appreciate uh, the vision and, and what we've done here. This is not eternal. I don't know what will happen 100 years from now, but I can pretty well guarantee you this building won't be here. And that's just 100 years. What about 50 billion years? What about eternity? See, the things that we get most excited about and the things that we are determined of whether or not we're blessed or not are things that are not eternal. They don't last. We don't last. We don't live here forever, okay? The blessings that Paul is talking about are the blessings that come in Christ. And if you have these blessings, you are blessed. I don't care how you feel. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you understand the blessedness that's yours in Christ, friend, you are a blessed human being. Now, here we go. The first one, we've been adopted. We've been adopted. What does that mean? That means that the Lord brought us into uh, sonship. We're as Christ. We're not Christ, 
but we're loved like he loves his son. We have a position like Jesus has. We have a place. It is absolutely amazing who we are in the Lord. Folks, we got a chair at the table. And it's there, not because of what we did or we earned it. It's because God loved you and wanted you and adopted you. Amen. And he prepared you. You are a child of God. I'll tell you, there's a part of me that wants to say we need to start living like we're children of God. Because we live in a day today that, that people that claim Christ in the world, there's no difference. We've got to be remarkably dis different, okay? Not only are we adopted, the other spiritual blessing is we've been made righteous. God's standard, and He is never going to change, is perfection. And none of us are perfect. So if, if, if we did not have something that occurred to make us accepted, we'd never have a chance. The righteousness that we're able to claim, the Bible teaches as an imputed righteousness. It's given to us by God. Based on what? It's based on Jesus. It's based on the sacrifice of Christ. It's based on the obedience of Christ. What He did is what allows us to come by faith, trusting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would have righteousness imputed to us. So you've been made right in the eyes of God. I don't feel right, preacher. Well, I don't feel skinny. I don't feel old. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, feelings are so fickle. It's not a matter of how you feel about something. It's the absolute reality, solid, truth, foundational doctrine that in Christ you are right before God. That is a blessing, folks. Not only that, we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed by the Spirit. I'm talking about that tonight. But, but the Holy Spirit that, that led us, convicted us, made us understand, brought us to a place of repentance. That Holy Spirit seals us at salvation, keeps us until the eternity, and He empowers us to live the life of Christ on this earth. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, we would never be able to do this. But in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can live the life that God has saved us to live. How else are we blessed with every spiritual blessing. We have eternal life. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. We have heaven. These are blessings, folks. This is not eternal. I mean, this is all we know. I understand that. But this is not eternal. Heaven is eternal. And we'll be there with Him. And then I don't understand this, but I read it and I'm always amazed. But the Bible says that we'll rule and reign with Christ. What a blessing. I mean, just think about this, folks. I don't know. I, I, I know we, I was listening to a song this morning uh, just watching uh, uh, a gospel program on television, which I rarely do on Sundays, but I'm glad I did this morning, just to bless him. Uh, uh, but in it, I was thinking about heaven. It just, it, it just kind of made me think about heaven, a lot about heaven. And I got to thinking, I said, you know, there's a lot I, I, I speculate, there's a lot I think about, but the fact that I'm going to see the Lord, I mean, just let that dwell, let that sink in. We talk about Jesus. We preach about Him. Do we realize that we're going to see Him and be with Him forever? I mean, that's just that's profound, folks. God has certainly blessed us, okay? Now, the next thing I want to see is that God chose us in Christ. Do y'all remember back when you were in, in grade school or, or maybe a little bit older, the humiliation of being chosen for ball teams? Do y'all remember that? If you were pretty good, I want him. I want him. If you weren't so good, by third round, I, I'll take him. Uh, well, somebody got to take the last one. I guess it'd be us. Do y'all remember those days? <laughs> chosen. Uh, uh, we we kind of have a bad taste in our mouth about the idea of being chosen, but this shouldn't give you a bad taste in your mouth. Because here's what I want you to see. You had nothing to offer God. Nothing. Well, you only had one thing. It was sin. <laughs> nothing else. We're disobedient. We're disrespectful. We disobey. <laughs> I mean, there's just nothing about 
any human being that God would see us and want us. I'm just telling you. I mean, we're certainly creating His image, and He does tell us that He loves us, and He's demonstrated that He loves us, but that He would choose us is mind-boggling to me. Now, He didn't choose us to play on a team. And, and contrary to the poor doctrine today, God doesn't exist for us. Okay? A lot of people think, well, well, God, I deserve to be happy. I deserve to have this and that, and I want this and I want that. And we kind of think God is a big old granddaddy that just chums out the gum to everybody and keeps everybody happy and smiling, and that's just not biblical at all. So what were we chosen for? There's nothing lovely in us. There's nothing that would cause him to love us. There's nothing in us but rebellion and sin and separation. There's nothing there. He chose us by an act of his will to be holy. Now, folks, listen. I want you to understand this. When we talk about the blessingness that's ours in Christ, we certainly amen that. But when we recognize that he chose us from our sin, adopted us, placed us in eternal life, imputed righteousness to us, there's a reason he did it that we would be a separate, holy people. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That means different. That means a different people. Folks, listen. We should be so different in this world that people recognize those people are peculiar. That's how they're described. We shouldn't fit in with the world. We shouldn't fit in with the status quo. We shouldn't fit in with the direction that we see this entire uh, planet seem to be going. We're very different. We're headed to heaven. We're not going to hell. We have life. We're not bound by sin. We've been set free. We're not slaves. Folks, everything about the Christian life is a setting apart for a distinct purpose, to be holy. And, Paul said, to be blameless. Blameless. Who in here likes to get blamed for something? Do you enjoy it? No. Everybody hates to be blamed for something. One of the, one of the uh, 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 sneaky way of arguing is to use blame. You ever, you ever notice that? If, if you've got a good argument going on, if you can accuse and blame and bring up something... And, and, well, it's your fault, you know, kind of like Adam and Eve. Uh, what have you done? What do you do? Well, God, it's the woman you gave me. <laughs> it's her fault. I'm blaming her. Well, what'd you do? Well, it's a serpent you created, God. I blame it. You see how that works? And we do that. Okay, so when we see blameless, we kind of think to ourselves, what does that mean? What does it mean to be without blame? It means to be faultless. So we're chosen to be holy, separate, and faultless. Does anybody measure up to that today? <laughs> Do you? I don't. I don't. So, so how does that work? The only way that I can stand faultless before God is to be cleansed by the blood. So that when the Lord sees me, he doesn't see Bud, and he doesn't see my shortcomings, and he doesn't see my faults. He sees his son. That's the identity. That's my identity. So, folks, I want to encourage you today. Understand what it means to be holy. Understand what it means to be without fault. Now, I think it's very important here that we start to understand, and Paul begins to turn the discussion uh, toward these truths. The first is, all of this, we would, we kind of come, and we, I, I think some of it's just communicating. I think, I think it's semantics. I think it's how we communicate these words. So I want to just pause and make very, very careful observation. We start to start thinking when we see this is, I got to start doing some things different. I need to start doing better. I need, to, I need more of the Lord. I need less of the world. I need to get in my Bible. I need to go to Sunday school. I, I, need, to, I need to read Ephesians. I mean, we, we start thinking about kind of, man, I, there's some things I need to do. I'm blessed. I'm, these truths are about me, and I, I, I've fallen short. We start thinking about what we have to do. And I want you to understand something. 
It's not because of what we've done that these truths are ours. It's because of what God did. I want you to see that. Because if it's something I did, then maybe I could stop doing and it would fall apart. And that's kind of true of life, isn't it? You know, if you start a job hot and heavy and you come in there and you're working and sacrificing and, and committing yourself and showing yourself and revealing that you're faithful and a hard worker and then later you start, you know, you don't really care anymore and then that kind of, it affects you. So, so if it's something I did, then that may explain why I feel on a mountaintop one day in a valley the next, tempted, falling, standing, falling, standing. I think that may describe a lot of the Christianity uh, that we experience in our own lives today. But, it, but it's because we have a false idea of something. And that is all of this is done because I chose it. And that's just not true. So here's what I want you to understand. Know that God is the one who decided. Know that God is the one who chooses. It is God who initiates. It is His choice and His decision. I want you to understand that. So when Jesus Christ came to die for my sins, that was the will of the Father. I'm a recipient of that, that grace, but God decided it, okay? You ever heard somebody say, boy, I was lost and I just said, end of my life and then I found God. You didn't find God. He found you. And it's much more significant when you understand that. That God found God. Me. He left the 99 to search for the one lost one. He, he turned all the candles up and swept the room to find the lost coin. The lost son. Do you remember that? The lost son. In the prodigal son, in the depth of, of where he was running from the father and running from living, if you, if you think of it in, in context of these verses, He's running from his place. He's running from his adoption. He's running from who he is. And it's a downward spiral. And he's, he's at rock bottom. He's slopping hogs. He's so hungry. He's thinking about eating the slop. And he stinks. And he needs a bath. And he's broke. And he's at the bottom. And then it, oh my goodness. My servants live better than I am in my father's house. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go back to my father. You know what happens? God right there, through, and if you want to make this a real life practical moment and not just a parable, the Holy Spirit convicted that boy's heart of where he needed to be and go. That is God's initiation that did that and turned his heart. Of course, when he came back, he found the father ran to him because he knew that he was going to come back. Did you see that? God reveals himself to us. If you and I ever heard the gospel, if we ever experienced conviction, if we responded in repentance, if we looked to Christ in faith and we were born again and saved, it is because of Him, not us. Okay? Have you got a grip on that one? Let's go to the next big piece of artillery in these verses. God chose us God predestined us. Some people do not like the doctrine of predestination. And I'm going to tell you why. Let me just go ahead and tell you why people don't like it. They don't like it because they say it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair that some people would go to heaven and other people go to hell. And that is where they determine that all predestination is is God saying, you go, you stay. You go, you stay. You go, you come with me. That's not predestination. But let me give you a biblical definition from the Greek and just to kind of get, okay, it means determining beforehand, deciding ahead of time. Predestined means that God chose the redeemed. And see, again, this is a finite human being stepping into infinite areas that I don't have any idea other than what's been revealed. There's no, there's no way that we can understand these things. 
But let me give you a few thoughts. First of all, let's look in Romans chapter 8 because it speaks very clearly to it. And it gives us, I believe, a well-defined picture of predestination. And by the way, I'm going to speak more about predestination on Wednesday night. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth to it for time's sake, okay? Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. And listen real carefully to this. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And that just kind of gives us a round picture of, the, of really the doctrine of predestination. I was reading uh, 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 somewhere, I don't remember where I was reading it, but it, it was a little illustration, and it's a good illustration. If, if, if you are uh, uh, coming out of, of Walmart in Slidell, uh, over there by the home, home, whatever it is, one of the building supplies, but there's, you'll see uh, people standing there with signs, I'm hungry, or things like, y'all ever been there, you know? And regardless of how you feel, if you roll your window down and you hand them a $5 bill, you do that because you wanted to. You did that as an act of your choice. You didn't have to. You weren't compelled to. You did it. Some people say, well, I'm not going to do it. That's okay. If, if I reached into my wallet and I took out a $10 bill and I said, Jay, I want to buy your lunch today. And then I hand one to Jeannie back here and I said, Jeannie, uh, uh, I want to, to treat y'all uh, uh, to some coffee later this week. I can give that to whoever I want to, can't I? I'm not obligated to give everybody $10. I just choose to give $10 to who I want to. Does that mean somebody might say, well, I didn't get $10, so that's not fair. Well, you could do that, but it's irrelevant. Nobody asked for it. I chose to give it. Does that, listen, here's the truth about humanity. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person born because of sin deserves hell. Period. Now we, we think we're a little too uh, esteemed for that. No, I don't think so. I'm a pretty good person. Mm -hmm. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. The Bible's explicit. That any are saved, period, is the miracle. <laughs> It's a sign of God's grace. So when he foreknew us, which means before the foundation of the world, that God knew you and I before the foundation of this world, the creation that we understand as our universe, we were known by him. And let me just, if you want to kind of blow your mind a little bit, <laughs> before we ever existed, we were known. And if we're saved, we're saved for eternity. And if we're saved for eternity, eternity has no beginning. I'll let that sink in. Just, just think about that for a while. Oh, there's a lot I don't understand. I'm not even going to pretend like I do. But I believe what God's Word says, that I was foreknown by God and that in eternity past, he predestined, I'm just speaking of me, to be conformed to the image of his son. So he decided ahead of time, I'm going to save him. Now we know by other scriptures that it's the desire of the Father that none perish, but all come to eternal life. And where people start splitting hairs on the, and the, I think the main reason people don't like the idea of predestination there's number one, the unfairness, but number two, uh, they believe that it, it removes the idea of a choice that a human being would have to make. 
We talk a lot about free will. We talk a lot about uh, God's sovereign will. Folks, there's a balance there. Uh, Spurgeon said it this way, and I think he said it best. If you're standing on a railroad track and you got one rail that's the sovereign will of God and you've got the second track, which is the free will of man, if you look far enough, they, they come together. They stay separate, but far enough in it, that's just the, the of course, obviously that's a, a visual. I know this, and I, I've debated this with folks. I've had pretty good lengthy, even sometimes heated discussions. Our will is subdued by sinfulness. And when we're slaves to sin, we're dead in those sins. And if it were not for an act of God, we would never, ever in our sinful condition ever turn our hearts to Him. So it has to be initiated by God, but when He initiates, I've got a choice to make. I do. I've been a preacher a long time. I wish I could tell you. I believe, by the way, let me just tell you something. I believe so strongly in the sovereignty of God. I believe whom God wills to be saved will be saved. I believe that. I, you're not going to convince me otherwise. I'm not worried about what Calvin says, and I'm not worried about what Arminius says. I could care less. I am very interested in what the Scripture says. For whosoever believeth should not perish. Whosoever is a mighty big world, a word. And the debates that we have today are really over debates of, of stands or issues or humanistic, not necessarily humanistic, but people who, who are very convicted. That's okay. I don't have a problem with that. But we can't disregard Scripture. And I'll speak a little bit more to that, okay? But the predestination that Paul speaks about here is to adoption. Let me go back real quick in, in Romans, though, just real quick. When God, verse 30 of, of the text from Romans 8, whom he predestined, he called. So when he predestined them in eternity past, he called them. Obviously, they had to be here for that. Him who he called, he justifies. That's to declare not guilty. Those whom he justifies, he glorifies. And that is a sanctification. That is set apart. That is that holiness that I talk, talked about earlier. And that blamelessness without blame, without fault. But do you notice who does all this? It's God. It's not us. This doctrine is his doctrine. A dear friend of mine that, that he and I would disagree until, we're going to disagree on this till Jesus comes back. Okay, I'm just going to tell you. But to me, he's got one of the best illustrations that I've ever seen. And so I yield to, to him and, and, uh, and I give him credit for this. You see that door? Imagine that door above it says, instead of exit, it says, whosoever will may. Whosoever will may. You believe and walk through that door, and if you look up, it says predestined to be here. That may help some people. I don't ever confuse the two at all, and I don't want you to either. Now, real quickly, and I'm going to just close up. In Christ, and we're going to be looking at in Christ a lot. It is one of Paul's favorite comments in him. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. That's John. But it has everything to do with Christ in our lives. If you have Jesus Christ, you're saved. If you do not have Jesus Christ, you're lost. It's that simple. How do I know? You know by your love for Him, your obedience to Him. It, it's, it's you either know or you don't know. And I, I don't have any other way to make it simple. I think we've got a lot of people in our churches that hope they're saved. In their hearts, they know they're not. I just believe that, okay? But in Christ, here's some things we have. We have redemption through His blood. That means that our sins have been paid for. We've been delivered from them, and we've been saved. The blood of Christ, the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ paid the penalty for our sin. So the predestination called us and chose us. The death of Christ paid for us and redeemed us. 
It paid the debt that we owed, okay? We also have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. That means that we have complete pardon. You are forgiven. It's one of the greatest truths that we can adhere to if we'll believe it. You know, most people who struggle with making, they, they succumb to temptation, they, they, they reap the consequences, it did the damage that sin does, which is always going to be death of some sort. It may not be physical death. It may be emotional, spiritual. It may be relational. Whatever it may be, it does its job. And it leaves its scars. And finally, in our brokenness, we'll cry out to God. I don't know why I did it. I don't know how I could have done it, but I did it. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We either believe that or we don't. But when He says you're forgiven, by golly, you're forgiven. I don't feel forgiven. And we'll go back to that feeling thing again. I don't feel skinny or fat or old. I mean, feelings are so fickle. We put a whole lot on feelings, don't we? Forgiveness means you've been completely pardoned. Do you sense the weight of your sin? Do you feel the pressure and the chains and the imprisonment of sin? It may be that you've never been set free, and it very well may be that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of that so that you might come to Christ to be redeemed and to be forgiven, okay? I think it's important for believers to stop living like slaves to sin when the truth is you've been adopted, you're forgiven, you're chosen, and you're redeemed. You've been declared righteous. You've been declared not guilty. You've been set apart to be holy and without fault. It's time for Christians to start living that way. Preacher, I honestly don't feel that. I honestly feel like I'm in a war. And there are battles every single day. I win a few, I lose a few. Listen to me. Jesus Christ is victorious. He has won. He is victor. He is, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is coming again to this world. If you're in Christ, He has you solid. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It is time for us to believe that, to praise Him for that, and to live above the mediocrity that we have settled for in our Christian confession in our lives. And folks, that's what the study of Ephesians will lead you to do. To let some things go and to live for Christ. Let's bow. Father, help us to see the truths of these tremendous doctrines. God, there's times that we can be very dogmatic and we can just be so sure that we know everything and every mystery. But Lord, I know that I don't. But I do believe that you're the one who initiates, that you're the one who chooses, that you're the one who calls. Lord, you make us aware, you convict. It's all through the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that we're redeemed today and that we're saved will only be because we responded to the work that you began in our heart and our life. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that uh, is here with questions, they're not sure, they're uncertain, that you might through these words through this study, through the gospel, through Jesus Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, that you would bring them to saving faith. Give them a new heart. 
Give them the desire to look to Christ and the ability to receive eternal life. And we will give you praise for it. Lord, I pray that you would have your way in this time. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.